morning to all of you and thank you for being here today with us. I am Sara De Rocco. I'm leading the Milan office for Marsh Benefits Division here in Italy. And uh, on behalf of Marsh Continental Europe and of Marsh McLennan, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, ESG, the importance of the S factor. This webinar is part of the Dive In Festival, a global movement in the insurance sector to support the development of inclusive workplace cultures. Its mission is to enable people to achieve their potential by raising awareness of the business case and promoting positive action for diversity in all its forms. Since its birth in 2015, being now at its eighth edition, Dive In has grown exponentially, reaching global aids uh, with events taking place across 35 countries and uh, attracting more than 30,000 people every year. Marsh McLennan is a partner of the Ivin Festival globally since, it, since its birth, and we are proud to sustain the change we would like to see in our company, in our industry, and in the entire society. For the webinar of today, uh, you can provide us with your, Q, with your questions uh, simply using the button uh, at the bottom of the, um, of, the, uh, of the screen. You will see like uh, a button called uh, uh, Q&A or Domande and Risposte if you have the Italian version. So feel free to provide us with a question you, you would like to ask to, to our panelists today. With more than 900,000 people working in the industry among Europe, with millions of customers served globally, insurance is, or should be, let me, let me tell this, at the forefront of social sustainability, so the S of ESG. Insurance sector is the backbone of the economy and can act as a true game changer because of its role in building resilience, provide protection and enhance risk management practices. An equal and healthy society and a boosting economic growth generate additional opportunities for our industries. This year theme is building braver cultures. We want to apply this motto to sustainability and in particular to social sustainability. Companies are actually making enormous effort in the journey to sustainability, but for sure the environmental focus has absorbed them the most. What's inside the S? Social covers so many things from labor standards, wage and benefits, diversity, human rights, community relations, privacy, data protection, health and safety, supply chain, and other social justice issues. So a very broad topic. It covers the people pillar, which is broad by definition and includes its own employees, supply chain, consumers, and broader communities, the entire society, I would say. World Economic Forum published in 2020 the paper titled Towards Common Matrix and Consistent Reporting Standards for Sustainable Value Creation, which included in social sustainability three main pillars, dignity and equality, health and well-being and skills for the future. And those pillars are what we are going to discuss in a few minutes with our panelists today. This framework is actually under review. And in May 2022, the World Economic Forum, in collaboration with Mercer, which is part of uh, Marsh McLennan Group, published a revised one in the paper, Good Work Framework, a new business agenda for the future of work. Pillars showed uh, are, mm, are something that reflect really the three main pillars we want to discuss with you today. I like to consider the social component of sustainability as the link between the E of environmental and the G of governance. Everything starts with people, their needs, their wish, their culture, 
in large and complex changes and transformations like sustainability, people are the greatest part of that and they can easily decree the success or the failure of every initiative. Why we should be braver now, as the diving motto suggests. The COVID pandemic accelerated many trends that are here to last and that have a direct impact on business models and consumers' behaviors as well as on organizational model and employees needs and perceptions like accelerated digitization, social and demographic transformation, climate change and green trans transition, continued impact of COVID-19 and long lasting implications. Businesses in every industry are facing challenges and of course opportunities in managing people needs, both internally and externally. New competitive landscape, different consumer habits, greatest than ever employees turnover, skills shortage, great requests for flexibility, people disengagement, new regulations, so on and so forth, just to, to tell and to share some of, of those. The insurance industry for sure has its own challenges, not really different from other industries. Insurance should be attractive for its employees, for its people, and for customers. In its transformational journey, the insurance industry is looking for skills highly sought after by the other sectors, so the skill competition. The market is changing fast, and so are people's habits and behaviors. Five generation of employees and five generation of customers require for sure a new strategy and new paradigm. The insurance industry is struggling to attract new generation, being consumer or future employees that often complain about lack of transparency, bureaucracy, poor innovation, low digital maturity, and so many other things. We need to attract the best talents to deal with complex challenges such as climate change, cybercrime, and other emerging risk. The S of ESG is mainly about our people, and it spans from diversity, equity, and inclusion to health and well being and beyond. In the post pandemic era, companies should be braver more than ever and put more S into their ESG strategy. Learning from others' experiences is fundamental to reinforce your people's strategy, redesigning employee value proposition, and optimizing the investment in all its components in order to deliver on total well being. When it comes to the S factor, the challenges that companies usually face are mainly about what the S includes. We saw earlier that the definition is so broad. Avoid the coincidence with corporate social responsibility. Social and people sustainability is something different from C CSR. But in particular, how to measure the phenomenon and make it tangible. If we cannot measure it, uh, it doesn't exist. This is something that is, uh, is uh, under our eyes every day. The S of ESG we were saying is mainly about our people and includes those elements of the employee value proposition that can play a pivotal role today and in the future. Just think about, for example, the huge shifts of the labor market in almost every industry between great resignation, quiet quitting, talent management, and so on. All of those uh, require profound rethinking uh, of our people agenda and strategy. In the turmoil of external and internal challenges, we need to invest more in the S of ESG and we need to make it more concrete. How can companies build the braver cultures and make the people element more tangible, creating clear strategy, measuring, and communicating clearly internally and externally in the main pillars we saw earlier, diversity, health and well-being, learning and development, is the main goals of today's webinar. 
This is what we will discuss. And let me introduce our panelists for this session. So I would kindly ask our panelists to join me on stage, switching on the camera. And welcome to Leah Lonsted, Principal Pay Equity Leader, Europe and UK from Mercer. Wolfgang Sido, partner, workplace health consulting leader, UK and Europe, Mercer Marsh Benefits, and Riccardo Zezza, founder and CEO of LifeFit. Thank you for being here today. And uh, we will start with, uh, with Leah uh, with the first question. Leah, in the past couple of years, uh, people attitude and expectations uh, about their life, uh, work, uh, employers, uh, goals have completely changed. Mercer had recently released the Global Talent Trends Study for 2022. What are the key trends you would like to share with us today? And in particular, how diversity, equity, and inclusion can enable the new people's strategy? Thank you, Leo. Thank you, thank you so much for for the introduction and for the for the invitation. So um, and very nice to see so many of you joining our call today. Um, I think this goes to show how important this topic is. Um, essentially, what we see in our latest Mercer at Global Talent Trend study is is that relatable organizations they hold the keys to success. So basically, organizations are expected to have a heart to come off mute on what they stand for and to make measurable progress against goals which are relevant to all stakeholders. So from ESG to diversity, equity and inclusion, and also to, to embody these to co-create the shape of work or the new shape of work. So essentially organizations are striving to become more relatable uh, by taking on the values and personalities of the people and their communities. And these relatable organizations, they have honed in on a few key success drivers. Uh, so one is resetting for stakeholder relevance, uh, building adaptive capability in their people and processes, figuring out how to work in partnership and tackle inequalities, uh, driving outcomes on employee health and total well-being, and incentivizing employability and harnessing energy for the collective good. So what does all of that mean? Well, essentially, we see this as a call for action for companies to rethink their internal as well as their external value proposition and how a focus on DI can help to shape this new world of work. Uh, so basically what we, one of the things we saw is that uh, through the global talent trends is that there was a significant increase in focus on DI and that focus goes way beyond gender. So lots of companies are looking at racial, uh, inequities are looking at age, neurodiversity, and other factors as well. From a C-suite per per perspective, what was interesting is that we saw that there was a very strong focus uh, with 43% of all executives responding, that they are re-evaluating their programs and efforts to support employee well-being and overall purpose of the company. And uh, this is then complemented by HR, uh, which where 80, 89% of, of all our respondents, they've, they have a high priority on, on reworking total rewards programs and packages. Um, we also saw, uh, saw some differences in response when we look at demographics. So a, a, a lot of the questions were also relating back to COVID and, and, the, and the close down at a global level. But what we saw here was interesting. Uh, for example, uh, Gen Z are more impacted by remote working uh, and women are more likely to say that their work-life balance has deteriorated. And also one in two employees do not feel financially secure. And this was mostly prevalent amongst women, but also amongst healthcare workers. Um, so, so essentially some of these key findings, they call for a more nuanced approach to DEI, where we are treating all employees as diverse individuals. We are acknowledging and respecting their individual needs and wants. So essentially we're moving away from a mindset where the idea is that organizations have to accommodate to certain minority groups only, uh, but we're moving towards the idea that all individuals are diverse by nature, which we all are. And, and that in order to retain our talent, we actually need to take a more individual tailored focus on their well-being. So where should we start? So first of all, 
what we propose is, is that you consider your DEI approach as a end program, as an interplay between the heart and the mind. So, um, and also see it as an iterative process and an iterative approach where you can learn along the way. So first of all, a really good starting point is to use data, use analysis, uh, analysis to understand the issue and also to test out your assumptions. So what you can do as an example, you can perform a regression based pay equity analysis to understand what are the explainable, what are the unexplainable pay gaps within your organization. You can use this type of analysis to unveil root causes behind inequities to really understand, for example, how does bias in a talent management process, whether it's recruitment or development, how can then lead to gender pay gaps? And um, how do the questions we ask when we recruit someone, how do they uh, how can they establish inequities from the beginning? And also, how does career inequities, how, how does that impact your gender pay gaps? And, and all of that you can, you can use strong analytics to, to uncover. Then secondly, we would also suggest that you support your analysis and your pay equity analysis with an employee listening or crowdsourcing exercise. So also get insights into what is their experience and, and make sure that you can see from different demographic perspectives, because there could be difference in experience between women and men, between your aging workforce, your younger workforce, your younger talent, new talent, et cetera, et cetera. So um, and the key here is really to engage with your employees, with your managers, and with other external stakeholders as well, um, in both understanding the issue, but also in order to seek input for the, for the solutions. And you can do this via digital focus groups, via engagement surveys and other tools. And then thirdly, what is absolutely critical is to ensure that you have leadership support. I mean, the tone is set at the top. And ultimately, it is leadership's responsibility. It is the role to drive the culture of the organization. So what is key is that you develop a strong narrative around why is DEI important, but also how is that linked to your organizational purpose and value proposition? How is it linked to your customers? Why, why does DEI have a positive impact on, on your customers' experience of, of working with you? So that, that would be my take for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah. And Wolfgang, I come to you. I think uh, you hear music for, for your ears, uh, delivering on total well-being uh, as uh, a new uh, relevant uh, global talent trend, but also the a good level of buy-in by the senior leadership. So what's uh, uh, this really mean for companies and what can be done in in this field yes you're absolutely right uh, sarah and thank you for having me on this panel and thank you to to the audience who have turned out in great numbers so it's exciting to talk to you across europe and to be part of the uh, marsh family here as as i work for mmb which is mercer marsh benefits and i think you're absolutely right uh, what leah said is music to my ears it sort of talks to the total uh, well-being proposition that we talk so much about and that you asked me in, in advance as well, what does that mean even? You know, it's as a minimum, it's about the integrated view of health consisting of physical, mental, social and financial well-being. But it is much more than that. I mean, the model is cognizant of the intersectionality between um, health and well-being, diversity, equity and inclusion, ESG, work environment, company culture, leadership style and job quality, if you like. So if I was allowed to paint a picture for you, and I know we will send some material out to people afterwards. So if people were kind enough to follow me and just imagine a pyramid, this is what we have learned from our clients over the last two years. What's really of paramount importance is physical safety, if you conceptualize that at the bottom of the pyramid. You don't want to go to work to get injured, but that also means you don't want to get work to get injured psychologically, not just physically. So you are not just dripping up somewhere physically, but also psychologically, and I will return to that later. But it also means that um, people want to be connected to the environment and to nature, and that's where the, uh, the agenda also comes in, that a healthy environment has direct impacts on individuals, people's health, 
that's a fascinating story and we could talk about that forever but you know the climate crisis does affect some people with certain chronic conditions more than other people and then there's the sustainability aspect to it all and on the next level of the pyramid if you imagine it it would be something around compensation and safety. So compensation, of course, provides financial safety, and we can't talk enough about financial safety these days. But it's also about psychological safety. Is the group that I work with um, safe for interpersonal risk taking? Is there enough trust that I can invest my true self? And for the first time, that idea of bringing your whole self to work that many HR folks have used really becomes meaningful when you look uh, at it through the lens of psychological safety. Is what I bring to the table relevant and will I be allowed to speak and improve processes? And there is that famous concept of psychological safety from Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School. And the research that she did so impressively was replicated by Google all over the world. And they found in hundreds of teams that teams with high psychological safety outperform teams with low psychological safety. So there's a big business case attached to that as well. I think it's important to um, have a human workplace in which people can um, have some control over their workflow. And that can easily be done without promoting everyone to be their own manager. That is just something that makes, be makes people thrive and more productive. Now, work, generally speaking, is very good for our health. There's many of studies that, that prove that, but it has to be good work. So that's a fine nuance to the conversation. Good work means where you can express yourself in the way I just described and where you can be productive and where you leave a footprint in the world, where you're connecting your own purpose to the purpose of the organization and everybody wins ultimately. So it has to be good work. It has to be inclusive work. So Diversity, equity, and inclusion always starts with inclusion. And as I have said for the last few years, health and well-being is the new frontier in the DEI discourse, not least because, and Leah alluded to that, and you did as well, Sarah, men and women use healthcare services very differently. Older and younger employees have different needs, ethnic minorities have different needs, and the statistics are stark. So we really need to talk in the context of the S in ESG, also about inequalities in health and access to healthcare that organizations are providing for their employees. And to be cognizant, as we have learned during the pandemic, that we need to talk in benefits about personalization. And personalization means that people have different intersecting needs. Some of them are carers, other have um, certain chronic conditions. Uh, there may be a form of neurodiversity that prevents uh, someone from working in the same way as others work, but they have such important things to contribute um, uh, to society. So I think the most exciting insight for me as a management consultant in health and as a doctor over the last two years was that our client organizations are asking for interdisciplinary conversations. No longer do they work in silos. Here is my flexible benefits person. Here is my health and well-being person. But they say, can we have all of us together and co-create a culture of health? And not least, very pragmatically, it's quite easy to actually to implement because if you know where you are going, it's quite easy to implement. And as you said earlier, what gets measured gets done because workplace uh, health can be measured, actually. And even um, organizations like ISO, who you might consider quite dry and technocratic in their approach, have created a new standard called ISO 45003, which is about psychosocial health in the workplace. And trust me, the criteria as are equally boring as the criteria that ISO always uses. And I take huge comfort from that because it does suggest to me that we are reaching um, parity of esteem between physical health and psychological health. And let's not forget that 50% of the world's population don't have access to the healthcare they need. So there's a huge role for employers to make sure that your employees thrive and flourish and are productive. And there are, again, very practical solutions to implementing that in form of global minimum standards for our global uh, clients. 
accessing inequalities in healthcare using evidence-based models. There is so much noise out there around well-being and not every intervention is evidence-based and measurable. So that's what we would like to do. And if you ask me where to get started, if I still have half a minute, where would you start? You would ask, where are you on your ESG journey? Where is the people risk element in all of that? Why did we in the past only look at infrastructure risk and finance risk and not enough at operational risk? The pandemic taught us to look at people risk. The, our work with the World Economic Forum showed us that people risk has moved up to the top of the agenda and mental health in particular particular but then we need to see what is under people risk it's health and engagement because if i am not healthy enough your engagement initiatives will not be enough to make me productive so therefore i would argue in my pseudo mathematical formula health plus engagement equals productivity and we need to contain that business risk and i hope uh, for the remainder of the session, we will talk a lot more about the positive aspects of work. So I have sketched now the risks, but I want to talk later about um, the positive uh, aspects of work as well. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. So many insights and uh, things to remember. Uh, Ricarda, we talked about relatable organizations, well-being, diversity. I would like to comment with you about the third pillar of people's sustainability we mentioned earlier, and in particular, skills for the future. As Leah told us, one of the global talent trend is built for employability. So what companies can do differently in people development? And also Wolfgang said, I think something relevant for you, bring yourself to work. So can you comment about uh, this a little bit for us? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. And let me see if I can, uh, I took some notes because the, um, the things coming out from Leah and Wolfram were amazing. So I have to react. And I hope I can take you in five steps from, from the notes I've taken to the answer to your question, which is a very interesting question. So what can companies do differently? And the quick answer is basically everything, <laughs> but that's also the problem. So first, why are we talking about this today? That's a good question, no? Uh, it's uh, why are we talking about human sustainability overall? And I think in a way, Wolfgang said, pandemic showed us that there is a challenge. There is a huge, big challenge there. My career as an entrepreneur started when I was a manager and I became a mother and this was a problem in my workplace. And this happened twice, but it, it was before pandemic. It was before COVID and it's still happening everywhere in the world. So we're talking about something very concrete and unsustainable, which is the conflict between work and life. How come that we are talking seriously about this and speaking about metrics today, and we haven't started 50 years ago when the problem started, when women, women started working? Still, it's good that we do it today. And it's very good that we speak about ESG, because as you, you, you said, uh, the speaker before me said, we need metrics. And once we have metrics, we can make things happen. This is how the process works. And uh, what's interesting about the metrics is that if you look at the ESG, as Sarah was telling, the metrics about the environment, um, they were born quite some time before. They needed a lot of work. They are still on the work, but basically they summarize into energy consumption and energy emission. So they have this word, which is energy, that we could apply to people as well. While well, if you look at the metrics in the S uh, part, they are a bit scattered, let's say. They, are, they speak about staff, turner, staff turnover, so how many people are leaving. They speak about training, but in, they, they count it by days and by money. They speak about uh, age. Uh, they speak about absenteeism, so they measure the number of absence. So they are very uh, basic and not uh, really well thought metrics. So this is, I think, a key moment for us to be a bit um, courageous, be brave, a bit brave on the metrics. And I think uh, the other speakers agree with me on this. But the main problem, so my company is an impact company. And I've been speaking with a lot of impact investors. So I met the way finance thinks about the S in the ESG. 
And I can tell you that the problem is complexity. Basically, nobody is investing on the human development because that, that is too complex to measure. So they'd rather invest in the solutions to the problems. So uh, uh, helping mothers who can't work, helping people who have work-life challenges. So it's services that in a way serve the problem, but they don't solve the problem because solving the problem seems to be too complex to measure. Still, if we work on human development, we're having a double impact because if you develop people, then they will behave better. <laughs> and so you will have an impact on everything else. So it's a bit strange that we are spending our impact-oriented money in serving the problem, meaning giving solutions to the problem instead of solving the problem, which is about looking at it and being brave about measuring it, about the metrics. So uh, what are these metrics? I think we should really take some time to, to be brave in looking at what it means. And I think it's been mentioned today, it's about identity. It's about, um, um, I think um, Wolfgang, you spoke about whole self. Now, we know that if people can bring their whole self to work, which is also called as preferred self, their engagement will increase, their productivity will increase, but we also know that they will be more ethical in their behaviors because they, they can put together what they are at work and at home and then will care more. So there is a potential if we find the right metrics to really use this S moment to have a real impact and not just start measuring what is already there. You know, there was a joke and then I'm done. There was a joke about the person looking for the keys under um, in, in the night under a, a lamp and a person asking her, what are you doing? I'm looking for my car keys. Did you lose them here? No, but here there is more light. So what we're, we're running the risk once again to measuring what is already there because it's easier. <laughs> Instead of using this opportunity to really decide what I was speaking about, what do we mean when we, see, when we say we want human sustainability, we really believe that human beings can have an, an impact themselves. So not, it's not just about helping people, but it's about enabling people to help the world by looking at them in a new way. Thank you. And I remember to the audience, uh, if you want to, to make some question to our panelists, there's the, the button at the, at the bottom of the screen. So thank you for this uh, first round. Uh, I challenge you to make the S of ESG more concrete. And I think you provided powerful insights about what companies can do to be more impactful on how uh, the S uh, could be, uh, how, how to create the S moment as Ricarda mentioned. Let's skip to another question. So coming back to Leah, what's going on from a regulatory perspective on diversity, equity and inclusion and gender parity in particular? And what can companies can do to go beyond compliance and be more impactful through investing in diversity, equity and inclusion? So making more strategic the investment on, on diversity. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I mean, there are a couple of, of relevant directives from the EU to, to keep in mind. Um, so I'm just going to uh, very briefly go through three. I promise it won't be dry. So the first one is, is the EU directive on equal pay and pay transparency. So this was uh, is essentially launched last year, March 4th, uh, 2021. It has recently in June been, uh, been, been um, supported by the European Parliament, which is great. And now it's in negotiation. And, and negotiation with member states can take a while, but it's, it's, it has sort of passed the first couple of gates. So, so essentially what is important with this directive is that it speaks into equal pay. So it addresses, essentially it, it asks all companies with more than 50 employees to have less than a 2.5% equal pay gap. Um, and it also promotes transparency. So it also asks the same companies to be transparent or have transparent salary ranges to their employees and as part of job advertisements. So, so coming back to what can be measured, I mean, pay equity or equal pay or pay gaps, that is stuff we can measure. And that is stuff that has an impact 
on all of our employees, whether, whether you know, no matter where they sit in the organization. So we're following this quite closely. What I also like about it is the transparency aspect, because transparency that actually prompts us as organizations to look at our processes and look at and be able to explain, you know, are they fair? Why is my salary as it is? What has been the determining factors, et cetera? So that's one, one, one uh, to keep, keep an eye on. The other one is the EU directive on board composition. And that was pending for 10 years, but it actually came into effect in June of this year. So that applies to all listed companies across EU to have a minimum of 40% of each gender represented on their boards. So that is already in effect. Um, and 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 uh, so that is is uh, and we'll be happy to share the link to to these as well for you to peruse afterwards. The third directive is the, is the EU directive on ESG metrics, um, and that is expected to be approved in in October, so next month. Um, and and basically, what what is interesting and relevant in that particular directive is that companies, again, companies with more than five hundred employees. Uh, are uh, expected to specify details on how do they support equal opportunity, equal pay for all. That's the first one. Second one, what are, what are, what are the, what's relevant when it comes to working conditions and how do they address different needs? So that again speaks both to, to, to our well-being uh, theme and also to address uh, human rights, including living wage. So, so I would encourage you also sort of watch out for what's happening with these directives because they will, when they are affected and member states approve, they will go into effect from, from 25, 26. Complementary to these are all the various legislative requirements that are already in effect. So in France, we have the gender index, we have the Swedish gender equality measures that look at, at, at the female dominated roles in Sweden that has been in effect for more than 10 years. We have the Swiss uh, gender pay equity laws as well. And we have Italy. I mean, it also came into effect a, a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of a lot happening already. And, and to your point, Ricarda, it is complex because there are different requirements. Um, but we, if we just look at transparency for, for, for a minute, because that is, is to the question of why is regulation not enough? Uh, it is not enough because um, first of all, it's, it's often not a, a very strong driver. Well, it is a driver from a risk perspective, but from more an emotional perspective, it may not get everyone up from their seat to do something because somebody tells you you have to. Um, but if we can switch the argument to doing something because there are opportunities in attracting, becoming a more attractive employer, then transparency is interesting. So we had in our latest client survey, we also asked companies, how, how, how do they view transparency and what are the key drivers? And uh, when it comes to pay, 25% of, of all of the respondents say that pay transparency is a high priority. And for 42%, compliance is a key driver. But 44%, they will have an increased focus on transparency moving forward. And interestingly, when we ask about, so what are the drivers? It's uh, the highest one is employee experience, employee engagement and pay equity, not compliance. So that's really interesting. So we're basically seeing a shift from a compliance sort of driven incentive to a more employees focused perspective. And I think this goes really well in line with our conversation here, but also with what we see in our global talent trend studies. Um, so, also, just to come back on, on the nuance of the conversation, we do see that, that more than 36 of our global clients, they encompass other demographics, such as race ethnicity in the DI programs. And many are, are also broadening their scope to include neurodiversity, social factors, and different life stages, such as, uh, such as menopause. So it really is broadening up. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Wolfgang, coming back to the mental health and psychological well-being uh, that you mentioned earlier. We saw uh, some, uh, some reports, some Marsha McLennan reports that uh, provide and show different vision about uh, those topics uh, since uh, 2021 and 2022. Uh, for example, mental health has been a top priority for uh, people risk last year and also a great focus on health on demand report uh, in 2021 while uh, it almost disappeared everywhere in people risk 2022 
So, and again, pop up in the global talent trend. So a very uh, piece and pieces picture on this that uh, absolutely is a, a reality. You, you showed us and share some, some data, some real data on this. Um, what's your view on mental health topic and which are the new frontiers and new trends also in health and well-being? You know, as you rightly say, mental health is reflected in a lot of surveys and it just doesn't go away. I mean, I have been in this business for a long time as a psychiatrist and as a management consultant, and I see mental health is, is constantly being talked about. Why? Because we live in a in an uh, uncertain world and stress is personal and everyone responds differently. And that is perfectly normal. At one extreme, some people feel fine or are even flourishing. At the other end of the spectrum, some people may experience depression and more so because of the times we live in. And there's this big middle group or the neglected middle child as Adam Grant uh, in the New York Times calls it. And that group is languishing, experiencing brain fog and doesn't feel comfortable anymore in the world we live in due to the cost of living crisis, the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, and the emotional loss of what we used to think of as being normal. And we are not even talking about the extreme end of conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a diagnosis that should be reserved for people experiencing extreme events like natural disasters, fires, accidents, war, rape, domestic violence, and so on. But you will also notice that the incidence of some of these that I have just mentioned has increased during the pandemic, for instance, domestic violence, unfortunately, or people spending prolonged periods of time in intensive care units, which can increase the likelihood of post-traumatic stress disorder. Some psychologists have even argued that we are now all suffering from collective PTSD, which I don't agree with, because if that were true, we would deprive people who suffered those extreme experiences of trauma I just described of an appropriate diagnosis and hence treatment. So organizations will have three types of bruised employees, let's call them, in this current world of multiple crises. Those on the front line of extreme life events such as the war, those related to them or close to them emotionally, and the majority of people who have increased anxiety because of the state of the world. And they all need different types of support. In our uh, people risk report, um, we saw that two in five businesses believe um, they have effective systems and communications in place to support the culture of well-being. Only two in five, so that's not enough. And the first step to become a bit more practical now, which I normally think our audience wants to hear about, is to reinforce what's already available. Most of our listeners have an employee assistance program. They have insurance solutions or similar resources like occupational health. We have recently seen during the pandemic that even EAPs who operate in a very flexible model normally have experienced some bottlenecks and some pressures and may not have always been able to respond to increased demand. So we have been on behalf of our clients reviewing a number of EAPs and evaluated their capability and their capacity. And generally speaking, they should be able to respond to that demand. And where that's not the case, clients were wise to run new RFPs uh, to get what they need. But we also need to talk about the breadth of EAP services, which are sort of the simplest and easiest mental health solution to begin with, particularly in the cost of living crisis, because not everyone knows that they also deal with financial well-being questions. Some of them have fully fledged uh, insolvency practitioners and uh, debt consolidation uh, programs on staff. So the other point I would make about mental health is we see more of it because we have been reasonably successful in destigmatizing mental health in some parts of the world. And we are getting closer, as I earlier said, to a parity of esteem between mental health and physical health. A study I recently saw in the UK shows that 51% of employees are now 
able to speak out about their mental health issues. But interestingly enough, only 36% are comfortable talking about financial well-being. So we know that financial worries and mental health are inextricably linked. So again, mental health is not going away. So what else are organizations doing? They offer virtual mental health programs that broaden accessibility and that is very welcome and those innovative digital mental health tools are key to scalability particularly in the prevention phase but also during early intervention so resiliency apps are becoming very important or the early treatment of anxiety and depression as well but as always we can't rely on tech solutions alone for human problems and they need to be balanced with in-person uh, interventions and empathy. So in our global talent trend survey that you referenced before, we have heard that now 34% of respondents plan to add more mental health or emotional benefits um, uh, to address the needs of their employees. And the good news is, uh, to, to uh, address the, the point uh, earlier made as well, um, by Ricarda is that um, there is a significant ROI, a measurable ROI attached to it. If you have a good mental health pathway where all your services are uh, pulling in the same direction as we create them often with clients, then you will find, and I'm talking to our audience uh, who are in the insurance industry as well, you would find that we have seen a 9% reduction in insurance claims for mental health, 16% reduction in average cost of claims, 41% reduction in absence rates, and 60% improvement of therapy outcomes. So that's wonderful. And generally speaking, a mental health or a well-being program well executed would return you about four or five times as much as you invest. And as I said earlier, the most exciting piece is that we are not looking at that in isolation anymore, but that we are looking at an enhanced employee value proposition. And for too long, we have talked solely about what's not working and human pathology. I think it's really time to articulate and live what makes people thrive and flourish. And that's the essence of the ESG agenda as far as I'm concerned and how good work can contribute to health and happiness and purpose was mentioned earlier you know a interestingly positively shocking stat is also that uh, people who have a strong sense of purpose in themselves actually have better health experience and even a longer life expectancy that's a scientific study even though it doesn't sound like it so what i think we need now is what i call a cycle of renewal a concept comprised of several very practical pillars that are aimed at helping businesses support employees through difficult times and to reinforce the idea that employee well-being can increase engagement, resilience and performance and make employees feel they belong by focusing more deeply on, on what drives them and, and what supports them. Thank you, and, and for sure to increase the return on investment on that side, we need to continue work on the culture and especially work a lot in communication strategy because you need to communicate well, especially in the benefit sector. Uh, Ricarda, if we look at the numbers, unfortunately, caregiving and care work are the most relevant barrier to the achievement of the gender parity. How the life-based learning approach can enable caregivers and companies to thrive. Thank you, Sara. Um, I really like the question, what makes people flourish? And it connects to your question as well. So I think that's where we see the problems, that probably you have also the opportunities. And that is what we do with life-based learning. Uh, LifeEat is a self-coaching platform. And self-coaching is something we'll, I will speak about a bit later because it's about autonomy. So making people autonomous and find their own resources in themselves. And we started addressing motherhood. So what happens when a woman goes back to work after motherhood? She, she has gone through a transition, a huge transition, which can translate in the stress-related uh, uh, crisis because of course you have a change in your identity and your life has become more complex. And this constitutes a work-life conflict and unsustainable because uh, caregivers today are 73% of a company population. 
Mm? So we're speaking about the vast majority between mothers, fathers, and people who take care of their parents. We're really speaking about everyone at the end of the day. Um, so how do we make so that this problem actually becomes the opportunity we're looking for? And this also relates to how, uh, what do we have in common? Because we were also speaking about how diverse we are. We, are, we have more than 100 people connected from many countries. We are so different from each other. We wanna, we wanna give room to this diversity. So how can diversity itself trigger a stronger identity? And I think that throughout these seven years of work we have done with 100 companies, we involved 40,000 people. So we have quite a lot of data about what is that we have in common and that we can actually use to make this complexity become a source of flourishing. Um, we see, for example, that every, in, in on average, every person has five roles every day, which means we are, we, we are acting at least five roles per day. What happens when we know that? Because no, normally we do it without knowing it. But if we know it, and if someone tells us, wow, you have five roles, that's a lot. What happens under a psychological perspective is that you suddenly your self-esteem increases. You feel like, oh, whoa, what, what used to be a problem? Oh, I'm, I'm running all the day, I can't sleep. How do I cope? That's normally the question I get. Uh, it becomes, wow, I have a lot of responsibility. And, and so research show, um, a new research from Kellogg University that if people are aware of their self-complexity, they will take better care of themselves because they know that there is a lot on their shoulders. And this is a source of self-esteem and responsibility. Second things we ask uh, with our self-discovery tool is what traits do you use to express each one of these roles? That's another kind of self-exploration that we don't have many chances to do. And people realize that on average, again, they use five traits per role and they're not the same. So we tend to use different traits in different roles. We, we separate, hmm? we it's separate our identities. Um, some of those traits are overlapping. Some of those traits are strongly positive and they, they show talents. Basically, if I'm, let's make an example. If I'm affectionate as a mother and I use behaviors that are affective, if I know that I'm affected being affectionate, I can use those behaviors in my role as a manager. And this way I'm acquiring new talents in my managerial role. So it's astonishing to see that 20, only 25% of the talents that people have are used at work, while 75% are left for the home. And basically those talents are the one the companies are looking for because they look for mental agility, they look for innovation, they look for creativity, they look for productivity, they look for relational skills. And most of those more free talents that we have, sometimes when we're not happy at work, we reserve them to the, to the personal environment. So basically, if we have the tools, and that's what we're, we have, I'm dedicating my life to providing these kind of tools for people to show themselves and realize how many things they are, how many talents they already have. This is ecological. This is about not adding more. If you think about training today, training is about or oh, you're missing this skill, let me give it to you. But there is a more ecological movement we can do by leveraging the skills that are already there but are hidden from work because they're used at home. One final thing, which I think is very important about this, um, Wolf was referring to well-being, to how people feel, when do they feel well? Well, if you, if you enable people to really count on themselves and coach themselves, when something new happens, when a new crisis, a new transition comes to your life, you suddenly know that there are other roles from which you can take out resources to help yourself in this new role that is coming. So you become a caregiver. Maybe there is something from your working role that you can take that can help you or from your parenting role or friendship role. You have a lot of resources that you can take. And this makes people more autonomous, which means more sustainability, of course, but moreover, it means they will become agents of change, bringing more care to the world, which is probably what we need right now. So I think it's a very exciting moment and um, it's very good to have data on this. Uh, we work with universities with this data, so I'm also launching a message to, to, the, to the audience that we are happy to do more research on this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ricarda. That's absolutely amazing. And thank you for this contribution. I'm perfectly conscious we, 
don't want to to run out of time, but just uh, in one word, uh, and the question is for for the three of you. What's missing to build braver cultures in people and social sustainability? Just one word, Leah, from you. Uh, transparency. Great. Wolfgang? You are mute. <laughs> Good work and co-creation of work, of jobs. Great. And Ricarda? Acknowledgement of the fact that love is power. This is very old-fashioned but it's true <laughs> <laughs> never goes out of fashion does it <laughs> great so great and thank you thank you again for for all of you for great contribution and insights and i hope to be able to arrange a new webinar with you and just monitor the progress and the new trends and so on what we what we learned today a lot of a lot of things a lot of takeaway i will bring with me today uh, for sure invest in people today is probably the best investment you can make in today's environment for sure a very and true complex one diversity equity and inclusion i like the definition uh, to to consider the diversity as the lens through which interpret people needs and health and well-being uh, are different today and for sure we need to rethink of, uh, of our benefit strategy and design the benefit plans in a more holistic and synergic way in order to address new needs that people for sure has and again we need to plan and build for new skills for the future Another takeaway from my side is that regulation maybe is not ambitious enough and sustainability reporting standards and matrix we mentioned could maybe be more detailed to better support the S, uh, the S strategy. And in order also to allow stakeholders to compare practices and to be more precise in understanding how companies are dealing with the people and social sustainability. And so how to support the companies with the, uh, to make more concrete uh, through frameworks and matrix uh, and, and clear strategy and to support how to communicate better the investment they already do in that in that field. So there are so many challenges for C levels and HR and maybe for all all of us in in this in this field. So hopefully many more to to share with with you. What we need for sure is to be braver and more vocal in the S of ESG. So thank you again for our panelists, to our panelists today and to our audience. And see you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Have a happy yeah. S day.